Today's topic is welfare economics. And when we say welfare, what we mean is well-being. Let's start with a couple of concepts. Something that's quite useful in economics is willingness to pay, which is the maximum amount a buyer is willing to pay for a product. This is how much you value something. And then there's consumer surplus, which is how much a buyer is willing to pay minus how much they actually pay, right? So how much you would, you would have paid compared to how much you actually pay. And the simple formula for it is WTP minus P. So willingness to pay minus the price. And that's a useful formula that, that we're gonna use. So let's look at an example. Let's say you wanna buy uh, a used cell phone and with, with certain features. And, and the cell phone with those features that you want, you would be willing to pay 400 for it, okay? So your willingness to pay is $400. If you find a cell phone with those features being sold at 600, are you gonna buy it? Well, no, because it's not worth to you that much you would only be willing to pay 400, not any more than that. If you find it being sold at 400 or less, then you're gonna buy it, all right? So let's look at some, some values. If the price that's being sold at is 350, then your consumer surplus would be, again, you start with the formula, so you write the actual WTP minus P, and then you plug in your numbers. So 400 is your WTP, willingness to pay, and the price is 350. So do the math, you don't need a calculator for this, this is easy. And when you write your notes, you have to do a complete notes, okay? So fill in the, the blanks. If the price is 250, then compute the consumer surplus. So follow the same procedure. And if the price is 100, then again, compute the consumer surplus. So you're gonna see that what happens to your consumer surplus as the price goes down, all right? One clarification to make is you've seen the word surplus before, right? Surplus versus shortage. Remember when there's too much of something, it's a surplus. When there's not enough, it's shortage. What we're talking about here in this chapter, in this lesson, has nothing to do with what you saw before. Okay, that was a different meaning of surplus. Here, consumer surplus is a, is a separate term. It's completely different. It's just, a, it's just an economic term, okay? So what is consumer surplus? Oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, it's really the consumer's benefit. When we say surplus here, surplus means benefit. It's how much the consumer saves, okay? So that, that's a good way of remembering what it is. It's basically comparing the price that you pay to, to how much you value it. If you value the product more than how much you pay for it, then you have a positive consumer surplus, all right? It's a good idea to pause here and ask yourself a question. Can you guess what is producer surplus? If, if consumer surplus is how much the, the consumers save, what is producer surplus? Can you guess what that is? That's gonna help you a lot as we go uh, further. But anyway, pause here, write down your notes and do the math, fill in the, the answers. Let's see how all this mess works out in an example. So we're given a table with a bunch of consumers and their willingness to pay. And the question is, if the price of a used iPhone is 200, who will buy one and what will be the quantity demanded? Okay, so if, if it's 200, you can easily see that because Sarah's willingness to pay is 300, then she's gonna buy for sure. And Al is also gonna buy because it's cheaper than what they are willing to pay. But the other two guys are not going to buy because they are they don't value the product as much, all right? So the quantity demanded is going to be two, and we can make a, a demand schedule really. Uh, if the price is above three hundred, then nobody's going to buy, yeah, because it's above the willingness to pay of everyone. So the quantity demanded is going to be zero. If it's between two fifty one and three hundred, then Sarah is going to buy. She's the only one who values the product that much. If it's between 176 and 250, then we have two buyers. And if it's between 126 to 175, we have a third buyer. And if it's under 125, everybody's gonna buy it, okay? So based on the willingness to pay, we can really derive the demand curve. And that's what we're gonna do next. But pause here and copy down the tables. So we're gonna draw the demand curve. Uh, remember again, we have price versus quantity whenever we have the demand. 
and we are putting the some values in the vertical axis and the horizontal axis so the first thing is we know that there is zero quantity being demanded when the price is very high right so we can draw a vertical line until 300 and that's the point where the first buyer comes in the first buyer would be willing to pay as much as $300 okay then until the price drops down to 250 there is no one else and at 250 we have the second person coming in right and again we remain at 2 until the price drops down to 175 at 175 the third person comes in and then the the last person comes in only at 125 that's where we get four quantity demanded and that's going to be it all right so that's our demand curve and you might be like hang on this doesn't look like a nice demand curve i'm not used to this why is it so kink there is it's kind of ugly you know it, it's like a staircase yeah that's true this is because we have we have a step for every buyer usually we have many 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 buyers right if you have many many buyers then you get a nice smooth uh, demand curve right but the logic is the same thing right so this idea here is, here is quite important that the demand curve is the same as the willingness to pay all right working with the same example let's assume that the price of the used cell phone is 260 all right now 260 is a price that only sarah would be willing to buy right so we want to find her consumer surplus right so again you would write your formula and you plug in so her willingness to pay is 300 so you plug that in minus 260 you get 40 dollars right so she's like yay i'm saving 40 dollars right what about the rest the others will have no consumer surplus because they don't purchase the product at this price okay so this is quite an important thing you might want to write it down consumer surplus is never negative okay that's quite important consumer surplus is never negative why because you're not forced to buy it i mean if it's too expensive you, won't, you just won't buy it all right so it's it always capped down at, at, at zero it doesn't go below zero so the other people have a zero consumer surplus and anyone who doesn't buy something has a zero consumer surplus okay i can't buy it so the total consumer surplus is when you add up the cons all of the consumers right so pause here and write down let's see how consumer surplus looks on a graph so this is the same example as before you can add it to your old graph um, if you didn't do a nice neat job with the graph draw one which is fairly large and neat because you're going to need it so basically the price is 260 so you would draw a horizontal line at 260 and we know that sarah's willingness to pay is 300 as the table shows us right so that 300 is is up here and we're talking about difference between 300 and 260 down here so that would give us our consumer surplus which we just found and that's 40 dollars right and because no one else buys at that level the total consumer surplus is, is the same thing right so an important lesson here is that this area the area of this uh, rectangle here is our consumer surplus okay pause here let's look at a slightly different price level suppose the price of that used cell phone falls to 220 dollars all right at this level we have two buyers we have ali and sarah so first of all let's look at sarah what is her consumer surplus well again same formula willingness to pay minus the price 300 minus 220 you get 80 and 80 is the value of the area of that rectangle now for ali the consumer surplus is 250 which is his willingness to pay minus 220 and that's 30. okay so nobody else buys it so the total consumer surplus would be the addition of those two so 80 plus 30 gives you 110 and that area under the demand curve and above the price level would be your total consumer surplus all right and here's a very useful lesson total consumer surplus equals the area under the demand curve and above the price level this is kind of important it's under the demand curve 
and above the price level from zero to the market quantity in this case it's two two units and it's always expressed in dollars so the units for for consumer surplus is always in dollars okay so pause here and write down do a nice shade of your uh, graph also wow that was kind of cool so let's look at a good old smooth demand curve that we're used to so let's say this the the market price level is 30 and the quantity is 15 all right so this is a different market whatever it is and we have 15 buyers purchasing the product at 30 dollars we want to find what is the total consumer surplus now we know that we just have to look at the area between the price level and the demand curve right this by the way is between if you don't remember you might want to write it out so we are looking at the triangle the blue triangle in the diagram so the area of a triangle if you remember from your math is half times base times height right so some of you are like oh no not again i thought i was over with math well come on guys this is not that hard it's just it's just a stupid area formula okay so bear with me now in this case the height is 60 minus 30 which is 30 right and and the base should be very easy because you just look at 0 to 15 right so the base is simply 15. so you plug in the numbers half times 15 times 30 gives you 225. that's the area of the triangle and that is our consumer surplus write down this is so cool you're gonna love this we're gonna look at when the consumer surplus changes right so in the previous example we had the price was 30 the quantity was 15. let's say now the price rises from 30 to 40. now before going forward just just think with yourself if the price goes up is that good for the consumers or is it bad for them they don't like a higher price right so that's kind of like an intuition that we have we just want to use a graph and and try to quantify it right so we have the price is 40 now and the quantity is 10. so instead of 15 people we have 10 people buying it and the new consumer surplus remember it's the area under the demand it's going to be the pink triangle so we have again half of, of base times height so base is 10 and height in this case is 20 and that's going to give us 100. all right so instead of 225 we have 100. Um, so so there's clearly a smaller area in the diagram and the number is is less 100 is less than 225. Um, the part that's a little bit tricky is these two reasons there are two reasons for the fall in consumer surplus so remember initially we had 15 buyers now we have 10 buyers so the first reason is that we have fewer buyers in the market so there's a fall in consumer surplus because buyers leaving the market five people left the market all right there used to be 15 but now there is only 10. the second reason is that even those 10 people who stay they are paying a higher price so instead of 30 they are paying 40. all right so the second reason is this rectangle the the, the green shaded rectangle which says that the fall in consumer surplus is partly because of the remaining by remaining buyers having to pay a higher price all right so those are the two main reasons for why um, the consumer surplus drops okay if you want uh, if you need to do a new graph do a new graph try to shade all of these areas and mark them neatly because they're useful and you're going to get some questions like this so take your time if you need to rewatch certain parts go ahead don't rush yourself did you see that it shattered all right so we're going to move on from the consumer side to the producer side cost is the value of everything a seller must give up to produce a good or service all right which is really opportunity cost remember opportunity cost is what you give up what you sacrifice that's what really what we mean by cost in economics an important type of cost is marginal cost and marginal cost is the cost of producing one additional unit all right this is quite important in economics first of all this term marginal is extremely important and whenever we talk about marginal we are talking about additional we're talking about one more all right we're going to see this term over and over again so it's, it's going to make sense after a while 
Um, wow, that's nice. Effectively, marginal cost is the supply curve because what the seller cares about is to be able to cover their costs and anything above that would be benefit for them. And that's the idea of producer surplus. So it's the price the seller receives minus their cost of producing the item. All right, so that's P minus cost. And that's a useful formula. So PS is producer surplus. This is going to look the opposite of consumer surplus. So really for the sellers, you are comparing their costs to the value. If the value is more than, if the value overweights the, the costs, then that's a benefit for them. Again, don't get this surplus mixed with the shortage surplus that you saw before. What we mean by PS is producer's benefit. So surplus here means benefit or it effectively means profit. Almost is the same thing, right? Not exactly, but almost the same thing. All right. So pause here and write down. Let's look at an example for the producer surplus. So we have three sellers with three different levels of cost. Um, in this case, Mona would be the most efficient one and Chrissy would be the least efficient one. By the way, this name Chrissy, I haven't ever seen anyone whose name is Chrissy. Um, I got it from your book. I don't know where they got it from. Anyway, um, we want to derive the, the supply schedule from the costs. Okay, so a table uh, with price and quantity supplied. If the price is too low, let's say less than $10, then nobody's going to produce because they can't cover their costs. If it's above 10, then at least Mona can produce until 19. And once it reaches 20, then Robert can also cover his costs. And once it gets to 35, then we're going to have three sellers producing. All right. And let's say this is a product where, you know, you have, you have three units being produced for, for simplicity. So we're going to, if you, if you graph this, if you plot these points and graph it, you're going to get the, uh, a similar, uh, diagram staircase again, because we have few sellers. If you have many, many sellers, it's going to be a smooth upward sloping line. So Mona's cost would be where the first unit comes into play. Robert's cost is 20 and then Chrissy's cost is 35. All right. So let's say, let's look at the, the producer surplus and look, let's look at an example. Let's say the price is 25. Okay. If the price is 25, again, if you have a graph, you must draw a horizontal line at that level and you must look at the, the producers one by one. So Mona's producer surplus would be 25 minus 10. Just use the formula, take the price and minus the cost. So that's going to be 15. And that's the area of this rectangle. All right. For Robert, you follow the same thing. So you have to fill in your own answers. Uh, make sure your notes are complete. And for Chrissy, you have to find her producer surplus. And your tip is if she's not producing anything, then she's not going to have anything. Remember, producer surplus and consumer surplus, they're never negative. Okay. The least is zero. So the total would be when you add up. So you add up Mona's plus Robert's plus Chrissy and you get 20. And that's the area of the shaded um, two rectangles in the, in the diagram. Okay. The lesson here is total producer surplus equals the area above the supply curve and under the price from zero to the market quantity in dollars. In this case, market quantity is two and the units is always in dollars. Pause here, write down and shade your areas. Time to put things together. We have this thing called total surplus TS, which is the welfare of everyone in the society. When we say welfare, don't get it mixed with welfare payments like unemployment insurance. That's not what we mean here. Welfare here means well-being. Okay. So it's a very general concept here. So you can think of satisfaction or, or whatever. And, and, and it's simply just CS plus PS. Just add them up. Now, there is a simplification to make here. If you remember, consumer surplus means the willingness to pay minus price, which is the value to the buyers minus the price they pay. Producer surplus is the price they receive minus the cost they have to pay, right? So if you notice here, what we have is a negative P and here we have a positive P. And if you add those things up, what you get is value to the buyers minus cost to the sellers. 
okay so this is a good way of kind of uh, simplifying and summarizing what is consumer surplus you might want to write it write it down and underline it or highlight it so basically in terms of the graph what you can what you're going to have is the total area the total area under the demand and above the supply okay so in this case what you have is is the blue triangle plus the red triangle when you put them together you get total surplus all of that would be the, the, the total welfare of the society there is this uh, movie pretty woman um, some of you might have watched it it's basically there is this rich guy who's kind of a loser and he wants to go to a party and he's looking for for a date for to take for uh, with himself to show off and and he he finds this prostitute and they start negotiating so let's watch this clip it, it really captures the idea of producer surplus and consumer surplus this week if you're talking 24 hours a day it's gonna cost you oh yes of course all right here we go give me a ballpark figure how much six full nights days to four thousand six nights at 300 is 1800 you want days to two thousand three thousand done holy shit <laughs> Any questions? Can I call you Eddie? Not if you expect me to answer. I would have stayed for two thousand. I would have paid four. I'll see you tonight. Baby, I'm gonna treat you so nice, you're never gonna wanna let me go. <laughs> Can I call you Eddie? Not if you expect me to answer. I would have stayed for two thousand. I would have paid four. I'll see you tonight. Baby, I'm gonna treat you so nice, you're never gonna want to let me go. Wow, that was cool. All right, let's look at the welfare cost of taxation. Let's say there is a tax on buyers, which means if you want to buy a certain item, you'll have to pay a certain amount to the government. Now think of this, if you are taxed as the buyer, what's going to happen to your demand for that item? It's a deterrent, right? So the demand of the buyers is going to decrease. And in terms of the graph, it's going to shift to the left, right? So we're going to have a simple market, a generic market for it could be for anything with our good old supply and demand and with our equilibrium. So QE is a quantity at equilibrium and PE is the price at equilibrium. What happens with this tax is that the demand curve is going to shift to the left. So you get a new demand D2 and the, the vertical size is the size of the tax. So the tax size is the dollar amount in terms of the price where, where the buyers have to pay, right? So we get a new intersection here and that gives us a new quantity. So with the tax, the quantity purchased is going to be Q tax. And you can see that the Q tax is lower than the original quantity. So without the tax, people would buy it more. And that's kind of obvious. The price that the sellers get is P sellers. The price that the buyers pay is a bit higher. Remember, the buyers have to pay a tax, right? So you have to add the tax size to that, and that gives you the price of buyers. So the price that the buyers pay is higher than the price that the sellers receive. The difference between them is the tax revenue of the government. Okay, so that's the case of a tax on buyers. A tax on sellers is somewhat similar. The tax on sellers is that if you want to produce something, you will have to pay an extra amount to the government. So this is effectively higher cost of production, which is going to reduce the supply. So the supply is going to go to the left. So again, you take your curve and you shift it to the left, you draw a new one and you get a new um, intersection. So you have the tax size, the same thing as before is the vertical distance. So your quantity after the tax is lower than the quantity before the tax. And the price that the buyers pay is higher because that's where you get it from the demand curve. The price that the sellers get is lower because they have to uh, give some extra amount to the government.
right? Very similar concept than before, because here the government is, is creating a wedge basically between the buyers and the sellers, okay? So the vertical distance there is the tax size. Now, either way, it's, it's, it's really the same. When you do the graphs for yourself, it's a good idea to do two graphs and make, make sure it's neat and large. You don't need to worry about this, the, the numbers as long as the shapes look fine. It's a good idea to also color code it. But either way, if you compare the case of before tax to the case of after tax, what you see is that the quantity is lower. Yeah. And the price paid by the buyers is higher and the price received by sellers is lower. So those are three things that we can observe in either case, whether the tax is on buyers or sellers. So pause here and take some good notes and nice, neat graph. Building on the same diagram, we want to figure out the consumer surplus and the producer surplus. All right. So we have the quantity before tax and we have the quantity after tax and we have the price that the buyers pay and the price that the sellers receive. Now, re remember that this doesn't, it doesn't make a difference whether the tax is on buyers or sellers. Effectively, it works in the same way. Uh, so what we're going to do, the trick here, all of the only trick here is to have your uh, dotted lines and then label everything. Right, so we're going to just put letters on all of these different pieces in the in the diagram and we're, these letters are going to help us a lot. So you're going to get some questions. All you have to do is find your prices before and after, find your quantity before and after, and then label everything. The consumer surplus before the tax. Now, we, we already saw this. This was the shaded area under the demand curve and above the price, right? So that would be A plus B plus C. That large triangle would be your consumer surplus before the tax. The producer surplus before the tax would be the leftover, which would be D plus E plus F, all of that. So we already saw these, these were shaded areas. The new stuff is the stuff after the tax. Now after the tax, you have to look at this quantity. We are limited at, at, at a lower quantity, so we don't go beyond that, okay? Now the consumer surplus is gonna be only A because the, the price that the buyers are going to pay is higher. So above the P buyers and below the demand curve is only area A. For the, for the sellers, the price that they receive is P sellers and the area below that and above the supply curve will give us the price uh, producer surplus, which is just F. Now what about the leftover? Well, part of that is the tax revenue. The, so tax revenue is kind of like government surplus, right? And we know that the vertical distance is a dollar amount that the government gets. If you multiply the dollar amount by the quantity that's being taxed, that's going to give you the area as B plus D. Okay, so that's the government's tax revenue. If you get questions like this with numbers, you should be able to figure out the numbers. And you know already how to find the area of a triangle and the area of a rectangle. So pause here, you can use the same diagram that you had, just put labels on it. All right, so we have that nice diagram with all the labels and we're gonna have a table. So we already did part of the table in the last slide. Uh, so you, you fill in your table, it's comparing consumer surplus, producer surplus, tax revenue, and total surplus before and after the tax, right? So we found those uh, elements that are filled already. What is the total surplus before the tax? Well, you just add up, add up all of the stuff in the first column. And what you get is pretty much everything. Okay, so all of that is a total surplus. After the tax, again, you add up the second column and what you get is A, B plus D and F, right? So it, it's a little bit less, right? In terms of the change, if you compare A plus B plus C to just A, you can notice that the, there's a loss. There's a loss of B and C. Notice that the negative is, is behind a bracket, which means both B and C are lost. Make sure you understand what that means. Both of them are lost, both of them are negative. In terms of the producer surplus, there's also a loss of D and E. In terms of tax revenue, there's a gain. There's a gain of B and D, okay? Now, if you add up all of these changes, so if you add up the, the last column, or if you look at the, if you compare the, the total surplus before and after the, um, the, the tax, either way, you get the same thing. The, change in total surplus, which means it's change in, in total welfare of the society is negative C and D. Okay. So this negative C and D is the amount that is lost in total. Okay. So that area, that total area, that little triangle there, that would be the loss of total surplus. And that is called dead weight loss. Okay. This is an important concept that we're going to have 
uh, later also. What it means is it's a fall in total surplus due to a market distortion, and that market distortion could be a tax. Okay, so you can say like a big deal. Some people gain and some people lose, and they cancel out. They don't cancel out because overall we are losing some level of welfare, some level of well-being. All right, so the government fails yet again. What a mess.